Today, we would like to speak about something beautiful and something that we see as very appropriate for the time being right now, what is happening around the world, where we stand in the world, and how we act with all what's occurring. You know, but I, Chazel always teaches us that at times of trouble, of times of stress, we lean on those who were before us, on those who are smarter than us, or those who were closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to receive guidance, to receive a, a, our path, and to receive how to truly connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and understand our world at any given time and at every given situation that we will live through. Today, Be'erat Hashem, I would like to do a very different class than what we're used to. Today, I would like to speak about a story. We don't always do stories, but some stories are essentially much deeper and have much value than other stories that we could uh, just hear. Today we would like to speak about one of the stories that Rabbi Nachman Breslev put in his books that Rabbi Nachman witnessed on them. And he said that this story is a story that no matter who will read it, no matter what state, no matter what type of person, where he lives, what he does, no man could hear it and not want to do Teshuvah. That it is a story that has so much purity and so many secrets that are hidden within it that it could bring anyone back with Shuvah. So that's what Abu would like to understand. Now first of all, before we get into this specific story, I would like to just talk about the importance of what we call stories. You know, but a lot of time we hear a story, we take it as unvaluable, something small, something that is not rich in content, rich in information. But really Abu stories is where Akadosh Baruch Hu hides the core of depth and of content. We studied about that much recently this week in the Zohar Kadosh. Of what it really means when Akadosh Baruch Hu opens up in a, a Lashon, in a language of tale. So we see even throughout the Torah that sometimes Akadosh Baruch Hu, he fills up a lot of the places with he went to him, this one did that, that one did that. That we can all come to the question of how does that apply to us? I understand that the Torah, we're writing in a law, a mitzvah, how to do, how to not do, maybe what to not learn from. But how does a story help me as a Jew to succeed, to grow in Avodat HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu? How is that used as a tool if you tell me the past of what happened uh, to Moshe Rabbeinu or to Adam Arishon with a tree, with an, uh, a fruit, with Noach, with a boat? How does it help us? So now the Zohar something that is incredible. I think something we always need to hold on, especially when we see in the parashot little uh, tail-like uh, manner or tail-like uh, language. The Zohar Kadosh says, any place, in every place, a Kadosh Baruch Hu wanted to reveal a big secret. He could not reveal secrets in Torah Apshat, in the Torah that he's given to all Bnei Israel. Not everyone could understand the secrets. Not everyone is at the position or worthy of even receiving that secret. So what did a Kadosh Baruch Hu do? He took those secrets and he put on them a suit. What is that suit? It's essentially a story. Where HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, you know, Adam Arishon, he saw a tree, he ate from the fruit, he did this, he did that. That is essentially, it seems to be a story, a tale, but really it holds depth that only at the biggest level of those who, who study Torah were able to understand the depth behind that story. And in that manner, and in that way, HaKadosh Baruch Hu was able to give the entire Torah to all Bnei Israel, and no matter at what level you are in, you could understand it, and you could take something from it, from the simplest level of person to the highest level of person, from the simple Jew that reads it and says, ah, you know, maybe I can learn a good lesson from it, or a, a good moral from it, to the biggest mikubal, like Rabbi Shon Bar Yochai, that half the Zohar Kadosh is encounters and explaining things that happened in the Torah. That Abu is in, it was so beautiful about the stories, that within every single story there is depth, there is secret that could be extracted. And even put more on that. In Shavuot, we're going to say it in, in, in a short a short demeanor, but in Shavuot we spoke about, essentially, according to the Kabbalah and according to Arizal and according to Zohar Kadosh, what is the best technique to bring someone back with Teshuvah? So there we explained that what? That all the Mekobalim give us direct guidelines. They say the way of bringing back some Teshuvah is not Kumara, it's not uh, 
it's not חומש, it's not הלכות, it's nothing. It's one thing. The strongest way, סיפורי צדיקים. Why סיפורי צדיקים? Why stories of צדיקים? Because Zohar Kadosh says, stories tricks it's a It goes to it's from the back end. We it's a he builds gates for a person to not absorb Torah. He builds gates not, for a person to not allow to absorb mitzvot. But suddenly, he hears what? He hears simple talk. He hears simple words. Where to the human ear, he went, he said, he did, he that. It is stam dibu. And that's what we say in the Torah. Vayitchanel Hashem el Moshe ba'et ha'i le'emor. When Moshe Rabbeinu pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he asked one thing from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He said, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, put your secrets, hide them in the stories. Why hide your, sto- your the secrets in the story? In order that your secrets will be able to enter into one's heart and will be absorbed and not fought by Yitzhara. And that is why Abba Tech's story is so important. That's why stories are a way for us to connect yourself to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but also we can learn a lot of guidance from the encounters that our ancestors had in the past. But this story, Abba Tech, that we're going to talk about today, is in the wording of Rabbi Nachman Besef, called The Lost Princess. Now it is a very strange story because we'll see that the timelines are not very uh, accurate and even Rabbi Nachman himself didn't write a translation. He didn't explain or abbreviate what is this story talking about, who are the characters in this story, nothing. Why? Because Rabbi Nachman said, I want every single person that hears it to interpret it in his own way and to try to extract that secret out at his own level. But Rabbi Nachman goes even further. What does he say? He says, this story is essentially the story of the Geula. And the end of the story, Rabbi Nachman will tell us exactly how the Geula will come. And that's why it's such a beautiful story. And that's why I want to first say the story in simplicity, how Rabbi Nachman wrote it, black on white, and then we're going to try to explain it uh, 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 from many different books on what we think is behind, who are the actual characters standing behind uh, uh, the characters in the story. But I still want, after even we explain it, everyone to hold all these details that we're going to see, pay attention to all the details, because the details are going to make a big difference. And after we, go home, we all go home tonight, think about the story and see how that applies to us, and how essentially uh, this is really a part of our world. Now we're about to jump into the story. Rabbi Nachman says, at one time they were traveling on the road, and he decided to teach and to talk to his students about a ma'aseh, an encounter with a very big king. Once upon a time, there was a king, Rabbi Nachman opens up, that he was very wealthy, very successful, he had everything. Baruch Hashem HaKadosh Baruch blessed this king with seven kids. Six boys that they were all ready to inherit the throne after him. And one girl. This king loved all his kids, loved all the six boys, but he had a special place in his heart for his only daughter. Where the princess was something in the kingdom to be something that was extraordinary. The king loved spending time with her. The king loved uh, talking to her. The king loved uh, teaching her his tricks teaching her all what he learned in the past, telling her, telling her stories, and truly he admired the princess like above all his kids. One day, the king was sitting down with his daughter, the princess, and they started to talk, and the king wanted to help her understand a few fundamental concepts about growing in kingdomship. And while they were in this conversation, they got into a little bit of a uh, misunderstanding. Where the king looked at his daughter and he told his daughter, I'm going to marry you to a bad kingdom. I'm going to give you to be the wife of another king that's not going to be here and you are going to be there. The daughter got up. The king said, go to your room. Next morning, everyone wake up. They're looking for the princess. And the princess is nowhere to be found. Right away, if the princess is missing, the king calls all his guards, he calls all his police, he puts a big amount of money, whoever's going to find her. He goes from city to city, from door to door, emptying house by house. And no matter how much they look, no matter how far they look, the princess is nowhere to be found. 
The king for years was searching for her. Years passed. And after years and years of suffering, the suffering never got easier. Until one day, the second to the king, meaning you can call it the prime minister maybe, like the prime minister. One right under the king. There is the king, then his number two. Came to the king and said, you know, my, my honor, I want to be the one that's going to go and find your daughter. So give me a protector. Give me someone that will protect me, that will walk with me. Give me a few horses and I will go out in search of the princess. The king looked at him, blessed him, said, you know, you are uh, truly close to me. Here, take someone that's going to stand with you, that's going to protect you, a guard. Here you have horses and go out on your quest, bring me back my daughter. The man went searching from city to city, from desert to desert, from forest to forest. And years upon years, he was searching for the daughter of the king, for the princess, with no hope and with no sign of her existence at all. One day, he was traveling in the desert, and to his surprise, he sees a path. Now, have ever seen how a desert looks? There's no path in the desert. Desert, desert, it's all abandoned. He sees this path. He said, you know, I finally found a path after so long walking in the desert. Let's follow it. He takes the path and he starts to walk. The path leads him to this big base of this humongous army of another king of one of the lands. When he sees the gate, he sees the, the protections army had, he had fear. He said, I'm going to come in now with the horses of, this ki of my king, with the, the flags of my king. They could think it's a threat. So right away, the horses stayed behind. And the number two to the king and his protector and his guard walked into the base. To their surprise, they were invisible. The guards are looking at them. It's like no one's there. They're walking in from one place to the other. Nobody sees them. For, everyone, for everyone's knowledge, they're not even there. To the point where they said, let's start searching these tents. And they went from tent to tent, from tent to tent, searching to see what's there. Suddenly they arrived in a big tent that had food and fruits and wine and drinks. And they saw a king sitting on his throne so they said, you know what, there's some food. Nobody sees us. Hashem is clearly doing something uh, unique. Let's go eat something. They go, they eat. He sits in the corner and he starts to watch. And he sees suddenly, he hears tupim, uh, drums and uh, trumpets and all these types of music making uh, instruments. And they're coming closer and closer and closer. And suddenly they see that what, who is coming? the new bride of this king, the new queen. And they see that the queen is being uh, walked around, being uh, 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 escorted by this group of people with trumpets and with noise. She walks into the tent and they're all making music and noise and music and noise. And suddenly, the second to the king looks at this woman and he notices that who is this woman? It is the princess that he's searching for. So he said, but I can't now come in front while she's right in front of, the, of, of a king, I have to wait. So he sat in the corner, and for meanwhile, all those musicians were trying to grab her attention. Suddenly, she turns to the left, she sees a man that will look very familiar to her, sitting in the corner. So she ran to him. She came to his hand, and she touched him. She touched him, he looked at her, and she asked, do I know you? So he said, yes. You do know me. I'm the second to the king. I'm the second to the king, which is your father. Where have you been all these years? So the princess started to cry and cry and cry and cry and cry. He said, you know, my father told me that he will send me to a bad king. The moment he said those words out of his mouth, I was ready in his hands and I'm stuck here and I'm suffering and they're trying to hold me back and they're not releasing me. So the number two to the king said, okay, what can I do? What can I do for, to, to, to save you, to release you? So she was crying and crying and crying. She said, you know, there's one thing that you can do. So the second king said, wait, what? He said, I want you now to go one year to find a place where you're going to sit. I want you for an entire year, every available moment you have, I want you to think about me. Or any time you have a, a second where you're not busy, think about the fact of how much you miss me and how much you want to bring me back to my father. For this entire year, I want you to fast every single day. And in the last day of the year, I want you to stay up the whole night before 
And that night where you're going to fast, you're going to come, you're going to pick me up, and you're going to take me back to my father, the king. The man was happy. He said, finally, I'm going to be able, after so many years of searching for the, for the princess, I'm going to bring her back. He found a plate. He sat down, fasted for an entire year. Every moment that he had, he thought about her. Every, he did work, step by step what she asked for. The last day of the year showed up, called his guard, took a horse, and they started to travel towards the tent of the princess to go take her to bring her back to her father. On the way, they see a beautiful tree of apples. The second to the king looks at it, he says, you know, it's such a beautiful apple. It's an incredible, I've never seen such a beautiful tree. Let me taste some of its fruit. He got up, picked an apple, picked a fruit, took a bite and ate it. The moment he ate it, he fell asleep. He went completely uh, black, where it says, Tafsao Toshin, a deep sleep caught on to him. And he slept for how long? For two, three, four years. All those years that he was sleeping, the guard was hitting him and pushing him and pulling him <coughs> and trying to wake him up. But regardless of whatever he tried to wake him up, nothing was helpful, nothing helped. They were, he was completely uh, in a deep sleep. Many years passed, he woke up, he looked at his guard, and he said, where am I in this world? For so long I was uh, lost. So the guard looked at him and said, what did you do? You ate from the tree. She told you not to eat from the tree. You ate from it. You were supposed to be fasting. And now what did you do? Hey, you missed the opportunity of saving her. So the second to the king said, okay, let's right now to run to the princess and see where she is. They ran to the princess and they found her crying and crying and crying. So the man came and he started to cry. He said, Mechila, Mechila, please, I'm begging you for forgiveness. So she looked at him and she said, why did you eat from the tree? It's already been years that I've been waiting for you every single day, crying every single day. But still, for that one time that you had to eat, you sent me into years of suffering. So the man was crying and crying. He said, please tell me what I can do to, 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 to change the state. So she told him, she said, you know, I have forgiveness on you. I, 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 I have mercy on you because I know that the moment you stood in front of the tree, you couldn't hold yourself back. So don't worry. We'll give you another chance. I want you again to do one year of fasting and being and think about me every moment and be miss me every moment and have your head focused for an entire year on the fact that you want to bring me back to my king, the father, the father of my king. So he said, this time I'm going to do it. But she said, but one thing. The night before, you need to stay up. And no matter what you do, you don't touch any wine. Because wine is going to make you go to sleep. And if wine is going to make you go to sleep, you're going to lose the opportunity. He said, don't worry. The entire year, he took it upon himself. He went one year again, the whole thing. After one year, they start to walk to go pick up the princess. And suddenly, he sees a river. He looks at the river and he says, look at that, the river is red. So he starts to smell and he realizes that there's a smell, a strong smell of what? Wine. Of wine. So he says, it can't be a river full of wine. That doesn't exist. So the guard said, look, the guard of the, king, of the second to the king said, look, she told you to not drink any wine. It smells like wine. It looks like wine. Most probably it's wine. He said, but look, there's no such thing as ri of, of a river of, of wine. That's, that's something that doesn't exist. He took a cup, <laughs> went to the river, <laughs> took a little bit, Drank from it. The moment he drank from it, what happened to him? Asleep. Boom. Fall asleep. Fall asleep. But this time he fell to even a deeper sleep. How long was he sleep? He says he fell asleep for 70 years. Hmm? 70 years. While he fell asleep, again the guard is hitting him and waking up, trying to move him. But the man is, uh, is, is like a stone. In these 70 years, the princess was waiting and waiting and crying. Nobody showed up. That entire base, after a few years, decided they need to move location. So they got up with all the Merkavot, all the chariots, and they started to move all the soldiers and all the, the tents, all the base, everything. While they were moving by, the guard of the second of the king saw that the entire army was coming towards him, not to attack him, but just to move. He said, I cannot stand face to face against them. They're going to run over me with their, their horses. So he ducked next to the body of the sleeping uh, a second to the king, and all the chariots passed by. And the chariot of the princess walked by him. What did he do? 
What did the princess do? She jumped out of her carriage. She went to the man and she had to cry on him and cry on him and cry on him. And try to wake him up. She said, I told you to not drink from the wine. I'm waiting for you already seven years, entire lifetime. But for that one mistake that you, that you had to drink from the wine, I told you not to. Look how much suffering you put in me. But still, I have mercy on you. And still, I know that you can make it right. And still, I know that you have a, a, a chance to still come and save me. She took her scarf and she was crying and crying and crying. From her tears, she wrote on the scarf, come find me in a city of gold and diamonds. I will be waiting in a mountain of, 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 of rubies. And she left. Seven years passed. The man wakes up. He looks at his guard. He says, where am I in this world? The guard said, you don't know what you did this time. You drank from the river. You fell asleep. But this time when you fell asleep, it was for 70 years. The princess came by. She tried to wake you up. I've been trying to wake you up. You were sleeping like a stone. And she left. They're not even in that same place where they were 70 years ago. So the man started to cry and cry. What are we going to do? I failed my king. So, the, so the, the, the guard said, she left you her scarf. He took the scarf and he was crying on it and crying on it and crying on it. Crying on it. And he yelled to the sky, he said, please, Akash Baba, help me. While he lifted the scarf to the sky, he started to see that with the sun shine, what started to appear through that scarf? Nothing. The letters that she wrote with her tears. And he reads, find me in a city of gold and diamonds and this and that. He said, look, the princess is still waiting for, for us to save her, to rescue her. We must go on our quest to find him. So they took the horses and they started to run and search from one desert to another, years upon years upon years of searching. And after years of searching, nothing to be found. One day, they're walking in the desert and they see a big tree. After seven years? After many, many more years. Jesus. Under that big tree, they see a giant sleeping. So they see a giant sleeping in the middle of this under a tree. That's very strange. So they walk by him and he said, maybe this big man that he's tall, he's seen her somehow. He said, because a, a, a city of gold and diamonds, everyone would steal it. So we have to find really a place in the middle of nowhere to find the city of gold and diamonds. So they go to the giant and they wake him up. They say, look, we're looking for something. Please tell me if you know where it is. So the giant woke up. He said, what are you looking for? He said, I'm looking for my princess that she's waiting for me in a city of, golden, of gold and diamonds. So the giant looked at him and said, you're joking. A city of gold and diamonds? That's something that doesn't exist. You're searching for something that you'll never find. So the man said, no, it exists and she's waiting for me. So the giant said, go away, please. You're saying shtuyot. It's not appropriate uh, what you're saying. It's not applicable. Well, go away. But he was being uh, stubborn. He said, no, my princess left me a message. She's waiting for me. So the giant, he said, look, it doesn't exist. And I'll prove it to you that it doesn't exist. I control all the animals. Let's call all the animals, and all the animals from all the world, they'll be able to tell you if something like this or not. So he said, okay. They called all the animals, and animal by animal came with a line to testify, a city of gold and, and diamond doesn't exist. A city of gold and diamond doesn't exist. And I animal by animal testified that this location that he's searching is a made-up location. The men started to cry, and started to cry, and started to cry. He was about to lose hope, but he said, I'm not going to lose hope. I need to find my princess. So right away when the giant, he saw that, look, this man doesn't want, I'm not giving up. He said, look, I have a brother. He's on the other side of this desert. He is the master of all the birds. Go to him. The birds fly in the air. If they fly in the air, they'll be able to, to, to recognize if there was a, a steel like or not. So he ran the same thing. The giant said, doesn't exist, doesn't exist, doesn't exist. He said, look, my brother, your brother sent me here. Let's not get into the argument. Send all your birds, bring them. Let them testify. They called all the birds, all the birds showed up, and bird by bird testified, doesn't exist. The man started to cry again, and cry, and cry. He was about to lose hope again, until the giant said, you know what? Since you're so stubborn, because you're not leaving me alone, I have another brother, that he's the master of all the spirits, all the uchot. Spirits fly higher than, uh, than birds. Go to them. So he said, okay. So he went to them, and he said, okay, let's, Please help me. And again, the whole argument restarted. They called all the spirits. Yalla, all the uchot. <laughs> one by one, stand in line. Everyone testified doesn't exist. The man was crying. He was heartbroken. He was about to lose all hope. He got up, walked away, saying that I failed my king in finding his daughter, his princess. 
while he walks away, he sees one spirit that didn't testify. And the spirit is shh, running. So he runs after the spirit, grabs him, he says, hey, where are you going? Why, why didn't you testify? He said, no, no, I was busy. You were busy doing what? So I was busy helping this princess that lives in a city of gold and diamonds and she's sitting on a mountain of gold, of uh, rubies. So he says, you were really there? He said, yes. So the man said, I'm swearing you to come and you have to tell me exactly where to go. The spirit went, led him to a city where the gates were full of gold, the gates were, were full of, 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 of diamonds and etc. I'm going to stop here with the story. The continuation of the story is essentially how he found the princess. But I would like to explain before I get to the end what happened until now and what really can we try to understand in a story that seems very strange and very, uh, uh, if you would like to call it even uh, uh, encrypted, very vague, so much to learn from. So I would like to give my thing that I've thought today on what it really is. But I want everyone about that to hold on to the story, how it is raw, the way Rabbi Nachman wrote it, and to try to, even on your own terms, try to reach to an understanding. This is what's so beautiful about this. Everyone has something to offer, to try to really build a build of how this is our world before the time of the Gemila. I would like to, to start uh, with our translation. You know, there's no doubt that when speaking about a special king and a king that is worth Honoring with such a, 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 a position, there's no doubt that we're talking about only one. Echad Who are we talking about? Kutsha Berichu, Akadosh Bauchu. We say, Akadosh Bauchu, Melech Malche Amelachim. Anytime we're referring to real royalty, we refer to Akadosh Bauchu. There's no doubt about that. that no, no translation is going to be, no different interpretation will be different. That king had seven children. Echon? Six girls, six boys, one girl. We have to understand, what is a kid? A kid is simple. The word yelet comes from the word holada. What is holada? It's like something new that is created. When a man comes to the world, he comes to the world to create something to leave behind. What does he create? What does he leave behind? His children! His children stand for him, his children represent who he is, and his children, you, through the children, you can see who the father is. Maybe we can say that those seven worlds, those seven children, are actually the seven worlds Akash Bahu built together. What are those seven worlds? Very simple. You have Olam Oren Sof, the highest one. Then you have Olam Adam Akadmon. Then you have Olam Anikudin. Then you have Atzilut Pira Yitzira. And Asiya, that's seven. These seven worlds are actually broken into two pieces. One that represents right, one that represents left. The first six represent the right, where they represent spirituality, they represent pureness, they represent a, 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 a lack of physical existence. Those are the first six worlds. Asiya is the only world that comes from the left, which the left is what? Material. Now we know also that right is masculine and left is feminine. Kadosh Baruch when he created the world, he created seven. Five boys, five right, uh, six uh, boys, six right, one female, one princess. Kadosh Baruch he loved his daughter more than any other world. He loved the princess more than any other child that he had. Why is that? So we know that essentially our world was the completion of the creation. Where until our world was built, or until Adam Arishon was built, to be more specific, none of the creation was complete. The Rakaash Baruch built up all these layers of six different layers just to allow our world to exist in the fashion that it exists. That everything was built for us. And we even see that Akadosh Baruch Hu fought all his angels defending our world, Olam Asya, the spiritual world. And he loved that world more than anyone, uh, anyone else. Now, you'll see that at the beginning of the story, it mentions boys, girl, then it enters to princess. 
boys is the six worlds. The seventh is our world, Asiya. Akadosh Baruch Hu's favorite being out of all those worlds was Bat Melech, daughter of the king. Now, but as well, Kadosh teaches us that any time we talk about the daughter of the king, we're referring to one entity. We're referring to who? We're referring to a neshama. Where any place, as well, Kadosh says, Bito Shel Melech, it was referring to the Nishmat HaTzadik. What is Nishmat HaTzadik? Nishmat HaTzadik is the neshama of every single Jew, which is pure, which HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves more than anything that, uh, uh, that exists. And that's why we say that HaKadosh Baruch Hu Mishtah Hashayim Tzadikim. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he plays with the Tzadikim. HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves to spend time with Tzadikim. He comes down to Motif, to motif Tadirakia to hear what the Tzadikim have to say, to tell the Tzadikim, Chidushim. That HaKadosh Baruch Hu, his, 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 all his love goes to the daughter of the king, which is what? Which is our Nishamot. And the Shemot that every single one of us love. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted our Shemot to reach to great heights. He wanted our Shemot not just to stay where they are. And this is a big question that Rabbi Tzadok HaKohen asked in his book, which is incredible. Where it says in the Tehillim, where do the, te where do the Nishamot come from? She told him, The Nishamot come, they are, they are uh, planted in the house of Hashem. So the question is, if the Nishamot are planted and they grow like leaves, like trees, in Gan Eden, and they receive their life from Ziva Shechina, why you send them down to the world from the first place? What's the point of sending them to a world where you know they're going to get a little bit dirty? So, the Bittu says them incredible. He says, a Nishama up there, it can't grow. Growth doesn't belong to Olamot Eilunim. Growth is something that is, a, is different. It doesn't apply there. Have you ever heard an angel growing from a kid to an adult? No. That's not something that exists. They're created. The way they're created, that's how they stay. Period. HaKadosh Baruch wanted the Nishamot to grow. So what did he do? He took five pieces from five different, from, from four different worlds, which is Chaya, so we're going to go backwards, Nefesh, Wach, Nishama, Chaya, Chida. Took five pieces from four different worlds, which it's already not debatable where they get their life from, at least the other two, Chaya and Chida, that's another issue for another time. And he took one piece from each world. Why is that? The Zohar says that for two reasons. One reason, that if the Nishama will go in the right path and the daughter of HaKadosh Baruch Hu will be able to uplift itself in Kiddushah and Tzara, it will be able to lift all the worlds with it. Where well, it's not going to grow as its own entity by itself. That its growth will be for the entire world Kula. Where the Nishama will be able to enhance the entire world. All the worlds, if you would like to, uh, to, to say it. And the second reason, that if the Neshama, which is Yetzirah Tov, essentially you have Yetzirah Tov, which is your good piece, it's supposed to pull you to the good side. If the Neshama fails, and doesn't pull you to a path of purity, the Neshama won't absorb all that punishment. Because imagine now, there is a big uh, uh, hammer, and you hit it on one spot, wherever you're going to hit, you're going to make a big dent. But if you take that hammer and you glue it with a big sheet of metal, flat, and you hit it with a big sheet of metal, it might not break anything. Why? Because the, in, the impact is distributed on a larger surface. So if the Nishama were to sin, the Nishama would absorb all that punishment. Because all the worlds will go down a little bit. And Zohar so says, by doing so, it is the kindness of the Nishama. So what did HaKadosh Baruch do? He took the Nishama, Bitosh and Melech, and he sent her away sent her to a world that is far, far away, a world that is truly in the hands of a different king. Which we know Elohim is not a word necessarily for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Elohim means, um, it's like a lord, which lord is a word that even we use in English for a, for a person. Any big entity, we call him Elohim, which is like lord. It's not HaKadosh Baruch Hu, nothing to do. But it's, a, it's another word, Matet is called Elohim. We, speak, we spoke about this um, in the previous um, uh, shiurim. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the king, sent his neshama away. In the morning when it woke up, he realized, what did I do? I sent my neshama to a world, a physical world, that I don't see it, that I don't know where it is. And this is where we say in the Zohar Kadosh, that Kadosh Baruch Hu, 
and you can read this in the, in the, in the, in the explanation of Parashat Echan, it's incredible. You see how HaKadosh Baruch cries and spills his heart out on his regret of sending the Neshamot down to a world which is dark. Where Zohar HaKadosh says, Oi Li! Oi to me! Oi! It's like, uh, it's uh, Oi! Whoa. Oh, say oi, everyone understands what oi is. I think it's a uh, whoa, yeah. Ken? But oi sounds better, Baruch Hashem. So, oi to me that I sent my kids to a dark world. Well, Zohar Kadush says, our world is like what? It's like a dark house. Akadush Baruch Hu. It's very hard for him to truly see within unless we bring him in. And we, those who are inside, are in black, are in darkness. Which even said the time of, of the destruction of Beit Hamikdash, Hakadosh Baruch Hu sat on his chair and he cried and he cried and he cried. He said, "What did I do? I sent pure neshamot down to a world, which they're being tortured, they're being held hostage by this, by this other entity." So we see that when the morning came, the king, what did he, what did he do? He regretted the fact that he sent his daughter down to a world that he doesn't necessarily. Uh, 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 if have full control because he gave essentially the will of free will in our hands. Within all that pain of sending his daughter away, the second to the king stood up, came up with the courage, with the um, uh, strength to go bring back the princess, the daughter of the king. Who is the second to the king? No, who is the second to the king? Second to the king is Adam, man. But we know Abu Tay, the only creation that could build and that could destroy in a godly manner is us. Our actions, our deeds, our mitzvot, our thoughts, our limud can build olamot ha'ilonim, can build entire worlds above, and our wrongdoings couldn't destroy. It's something that was only given to man. No other creation not angels, not melachim, not animals, nothing but HaKadosh Baruch Hu has that power of building and destroying. Second to the king. Man got up and said, I will save your neshama. I will save your daughter. I will save the princess. But I can't do it by myself. I can't go alone. And that's what the Torah HaKadosh says. That when HaKadosh Baruch Hu was creating man, the Torah came to Hashem and said, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, you're doing a big mistake. You're sending man to a place where the one who runs it is made out of fire and you're giving him a suit of flesh. It doesn't make sense. So what does Baruch Hu tell the Torah Kedusha? The Torah Kedusha says that Baruch Hu told the Torah Kedusha, don't worry, Na'aseh Adam. What does that mean? The Torah it says in Parashat Barashit, Na'aseh. Na'aseh is plural. We will make man. Where are we? Where is we? We know HaKadosh Baruch Hu is one and only one. That's it. There's no other. And not Milvado. So where is we? Na'ase Adam. The Torah says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu told the Torah, if me and you partner together and you go down with man to that world, you can protect him and you can guide him through that path and be with him. And the Torah accepted. And that was the protector of the second man. But now HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, okay, now you need horses. Well, who are the horses of, of HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Malachi Sharet, where we say and we learn about the Simonim, what Neshamot bring down, what, what Malachim bring down the Neshamot to the world, what Malachim stand with the person at any given moment, what angels uh, 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 even teach that man Torah when he's in the stomach of his mother, where Malachi Sharet bring a person to every single point in his life, every single destination, there is, there is horses, there is messengers of HaKadosh Baruch, taking him there, guiding him there. That is Malachi Sharet. And now the long journey of the, second, of the second to the king to go find the princess. So go down to the world and to search for the, for, for the daughter of the king and bring her back safe to HaKadosh Baruch And that's where he searches in Midbar. Desert, as Zohar HaKadosh says, it's dark. Anytime it says Midbar, it's referring to something black. Somewhere that there's beginning but no end. There's no plan to exit. That's a desert. There's no life in it. Uh, there's no water in it. It's essentially a place that is uh, deserted. <laughs> deserted, desert. It's, it makes a little bit of a... I, now, I, now I found that out. Uh, it makes a little bit of sense, the right? So in any case, uh, they go on this long quest to find 
the daughter of the, uh, of the queen. Suddenly, they arrive to a path, but they go into that path, which we know in our life we have many paths. Some good, some bad, some take us to big successes, some take us to big failures. And the end of this path, they see what? They see an entire army of what? Of soldiers that don't belong to, their, to, the, to that kingdom. Which in other words, and in the, in the, in the, the wording of Rabbi Shon Baruchai, how do we call them? Chitzonim. What are Chitzonim? In translation, outsiders. When the second of the king saw that, the Adam, he saw all the, the mazikim that take this, how am I going to go into that place? And Bichlal, the horses, which are Malachi Sharet, we know that, it's mentioned in many, many places in the Torah, whenever a person does sin, all, the, all his protective Malachim, they leave him. It's even to Yaakov Avinu, how come Yaakov had to fight the Malach of Esav? So it said because, Malach Hashem, which is not even the name of an angel, Malach Hashem is the name of a Merkava, which carries angels, left him at the time when he put himself in danger to fight Esav's angel. Because what Kaddish says, that when a person find, goes in specific places, Malach Asharet cannot go with you. They cannot protect you. If a go, person puts himself in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a dangerous place, or a place of Tu'an, in a place of impurity, Malach Asharet are not allowed. They stay back. The horses were left behind. But here, we need to walk together into this war zone, second to the king, and his guard. Who is his guard? The Torah Kedusha. And as long as he was with the Torah Kedusha, what was able to happen to him? No one saw that. Nobody started with them. Nobody uh, questioned who they are. Why are they in the tent of the king? Nothing. And they arrived to the tent of the king, and it's what, 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 what Arizal even says. It's something incredible. Something that we always tell young people that only now getting themselves, uh, or even older people, that only at a certain point in their life, later period of their time, they find uh, they get exposed to Akadosh Baruch Hu. They say, but you know, it's, it's been so long. I mean, so it's, ne it's, it's never been. How can I really do Teshuvah? How can I come close to Akadosh Baruch Hu after all those years that I mean, of a person going so low in, in Tum'ah and Sitach? How, how can you do Teshuvah and become pure again? So Arizal gives a beautiful answer about that. And Arizal says that, you know, we, we all come here for a reason. Nahon, we don't come here for no reason. We come here for a purpose. We come here to, to, to fulfill a, a mission. That is a black and white. But in order to start that mission and preparation, we need to also do the same damage. That's what that says. What does that mean? It means, if you're supposed to repair something that is at this point, and a normal neshama is here, in order to reach to a place of a normal neshama, the gilgu needs to go down, reach to that place where he needs to repair, and from that place he repairs. So we say, the moment you heard that sentence, it means that you reached your point where you have to start preparing. Because now that's it. Now that you are awakened, you cannot continue to go lower and lower because I have to do my tikkun. No. The moment that Kadosh Baruch Hu brought you to a place where you heard words like that, it's your time to wake up and to start to, to, to grow. So the secondary to the king, he had to enter into that place in order to save what? In order to save that nishama, in order to save the princess. When they arrived to the king, when the, when the queen, when the princess saw a second to the king, she got excited. She's sitting there in a palace that doesn't belong to her, with these people with noise trying to distract her, trying to keep her busy. Well, they take the man, they take a person on his uh, a long lost path where there is no Yeshua, where there is nothing where that evil king needed to keep the attention by putting music and making noise. With Santa Rabotai, even our own spirituality is not really uh, present. Because even our own spirituality is busy with too much noise, too much sitach, too much dirty scenes, and too, many, too many things around. It's hard to focus when there's a lot of noise. That's what Yitzhah does. But when the princess saw the second to the, to the man, what does she do? She comes to the person and she touches him. What is that touch? Now, but I, every, every person in their life has reached a place where suddenly they feel a trachut, a renewal, a pull to feed their neshama. Where, whether if it's happiness, where a person got, uh, got married, uh, who blessed him, made him healthy, or it's a bad thing, we all reach to that point where our neshama becomes more present within ourselves, and suddenly, <laughs> we start to really realize that there's something here. 
And at that point, what does Neshama do? It starts to beg each and every one of us. Please, do teshuva. Take me out of here. Release me from here. I'm inside a kingdom. I'm being held hostage by the Satan, by this king that is not a good place. Please, go a year. Do teshuva. Have some regret of, of, uh, 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 of the words of my father. Try to repair it. Try to uh, bring it chachut. What happens in that moment? The person gets inspired. And he says, I'm going to go to save that neshama. And he does an entire year of going and of fasting and of remembering and not forgetting and regretting and all what he's supposed to do. At the end of the year, when the journey is about to come to an end, he goes to pick up the neshama. He goes to bring back the neshama to a complete revolution, to back to its king, back to Kuchay Berichu. He suddenly he meets what? He meets the tree. The tree of what? The tree of apples. In Abutai, this is essentially, this part of this Ma'aseh, is essentially the technique in the fight of Yetzara and the existence of Yetzara in this world. In Abutai, if we go to the first sin that ever existed, the sin of the tree of knowledge, so first of all, it's already uh, incredible of why we call it the tree of knowledge, which was essentially the core of the destruction of the world. But we also see that the fashion of how Yitzhara made Adam's sin was very unique. We see that Yitzhara didn't come forward physically and tell Adam, go sin. What did he do? Zohar says he stood behind the snake, held the back of the head of the snake, and he controlled the snake, whereas Zohar said he rode the snake like a camel, that's what the Zohar says, in order to make Chava, which is a secondary messenger, to push him to sin. The only place and time where we can fight a person is not Begalui. Not in the revealed battleground where he pulls out your, his sword, you pull out your sword and you go to fight. Yetzirah's only strength and only way to fight the person is where? In the darkness. Something, a place where it's not revealed. A place where you don't even know that you're fighting it, Sarah. Well, what does he do? He hides behind the snake. He goes to Chava. He makes Chava go to you. Where you're being pushed around left and right without even your own Yediyah that you're fighting a war. And that's the only method of Yetzirah to fight a person. Yetzirah's strength is in the darkness. Yetzirah's strength is fighting a war that you don't even know that, you, that exists because you don't see it in front of you. That's what Yitzhak does in this world. He comes to the person and he blocks a person from seeing, first of all, who he is, who created him, what he's built from, ten tzfirot, all the miracles that HaKadosh Baruch Hu did to him. Well, we know HaKadosh Baruch Hu, after the sin of Adam HaRishon, the Satan proved his technique works. We're fighting in the darkness and not fighting in the light. The Satan said, no problem, I want my half. And that is where HaKadosh Baruch essentially cut the world in half. When until that point, the sun didn't, uh, didn't, didn't set. The sun was always there. That's why it's said Adam HaRishon, when the sun set the first day, he thought Hashem was destroying the world. The, the, light, the, the world was only light. The moment the Satan were able to make Adam fall with a technique of fighting in the darkest behind the snake, right away, Yetzara took grasp of half the world. We say ze, lumat ze, ba elokim, at any given point you have half the world light, half the world darkness. When it's dark, Yitzhara fights. Where a person is not able to see, that's when Yitzhara fights. As we know, we live in a world of Asiya, which is essentially the the physical piece, because that world split. Yitzhara, he built a wall between us and Akadosh Baruch to the point where, in order to find him, Zohar says you have to make holes in that cottage. We had Sarah hold us hostage in a dark place. The only way you can find light is if you drill the holes in the, in, in, in the, in the wall to absorb some light of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But if you're not the one drilling the holes and searching for Hashem, you won't find HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Because Yitzhara has us completely covered. His fight is only in the dark. And that is why Rabotai, Yitzhara, doesn't fight a person face to face. He fights a person where? In his dat, 
his mind. And that is essentially the first sin. What is the first sin? It was caused by a fight that it's like in the dot. It is hidden. Where Yitzhara is hiding in there, doing a war, and we're not even aware that we're even doing a war. You know, I to the point, something that I don't understand. Truly, I don't understand. How is it possible that any man sin? Put aside tzaddik, but every, any simple person. You know, one time, uh, somebody in a shul was very, very far. And there was a question that most probably he studied at school that he wanted to let go of. Where he said, you know, Rav, prove to me that I created the world. So Bemuna, I wanted to take something and to throw it at him. But I'll tell you why. I said, okay, theoretically, if a rock was to fly and hit your head, okay, can I claim that the rock flew by itself and landed on your head and nobody threw it? He said, no. I said, so who threw the rock? He said, somebody threw the rock. I said, so who created the world? What? If the rock can't fly without someone throwing it, the world can cre exist without somebody creating it? So if it's so simple and makes such a simple sense, well, I think any kid, even the first grader will understand this concept that a rock will not fly without somebody throwing it, then we, we all clearly believe that Kushpah created the world. But if we believe that Kushpah created the world, and he's looking at us, how are we pulled and how do we have the audacity to sin at all? And the reality that is simple. Because Yitzhara pulls us from a place that he, we don't even know that he's pulling us. And that's where we see that in both of these situations, Adam Arishon's story and the story of Rabbi Nachman, where did Sarah rest? He rests where? He rests in a tree. I'm no harm to you. I cannot move. I have no agenda. I am not going to do anything sneaky. You're going to come. There is no way. Uh, there is no chokhmut. And that is how Yitzhara pulls man to sin. Where the, the Zohar Kaddish says, one interpretation. Melchemet Gog Umagog is a war Shebadat. It is a war that exists in our head. Because the fact that we believe and we still sin, believe it, we're clearly fighting a big war. After we give in to Yitzhara, sometimes he's able to pull us into a sleep. Where we can drift away, not even realizing where we are, what we're doing, sinning. Sinning becomes, it loses its, uh, its, uh, its, uh, its uh, severity. Where one time, two times, three times you sin at a certain point, you don't even feel like you're sinning. You fall into a complete sleep. And Akadosh Baruch Hu's messenger is hitting you and waking him up and shaking him, which is the Torah, his messenger. But still, sometimes we don't always wake up. Akadosh Baruch Hu proves to us and gives us all these sweet, like honey, ways of waking us up, bringing us back in the path. Go, save the princess, save your neshama. But we stay sleeping until one day something happens and he wakes up and he says, where am I in this world? What did I do? So he runs back to his neshama and he begs his neshama, please, give me a second chance. And the neshama screams at him. I told you not to eat. Why did you eat? Why did you sin? I gave you black and white rules. You couldn't hold on to those rules and save me? That one sin could have changed the entire world. Where we say in Zohar Kadosh and Parashat Yitro, every single year, a Kadosh Baruch does a scale. If the scale has one more mitzvah, then Averai brings the Geula. One more Averai, then mitzvah, the world is destroyed. One more mitzvah and you were to bring the Geula. If any one of us were to get up and to do one mitzvah extra, the Geula comes because there's more. We say, What does that mean? We always lead to the majority. One more, the Geula were to come. It's that simple, Abote. So, uh, uh, the Shaman, the princess says, even though you sinned, even though you did bad, even though for one more hour you could have saved me, still, you have a second chance. Go. Do it another year, but this time, don't drink wine. Don't go and find yourself in a place where you're going to fall asleep again. And the Shama goes on a quest to go to bring purity, to go to bring cleaning. A year passes, he walks by the river, and what argument did Yitzhara make this time? Yitzhara says, look, my friend, logic is very simple. Water goes inside river, wine sits in a barrel. It can look like wine, it could smell like wine, but it's water. That's what makes sense. 
And suddenly we find ourselves in places where we say, you know, I'm going to listen to logic this time. Well, logic is, a, is a, the closest thing that we, that we take as fact. But really, logic is what? It's the opposite of imuna. Because if you're going to have logic, logic and imuna, igayon and imuna, they don't exist together. And logic is one of the one things that can pull a person down to a complete pit where he will lose his entire life to the hand of Yetzirah in a complete sleep. Without even knowing that he's a nothing, nothing, completely sleeping. And that's what a, 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 logic is not even more, to go further than that. Logic can be changed. Go back a uh, hundred years. Tell them that today you're going to have people with glass plates that you can uh, uh, take, a, a, take a, a freeze a moment in time and place and keep it forever. They're going to tell you, you lost your mind. That's not logical. But still it makes sense now. Why? Because logic could change. Logic is the biggest gift of Yetzirah. Sense is the biggest strategy that the Yetzirah uses to bring us to whatever place he wants to. And that Abu is the scariest thing that we have to stay away from. Because if we fall in that pit, what can possibly happen? We can end up losing our entire lives just to being, because it makes sense. The Torah doesn't make sense. Getting up, waking up early, going to tefillah, sending our kids to do a school, buying double the price cash share, doesn't make sense. But still, that's the path. Sense will always change. The path will never change. After many years of sleeping, he wakes up and he says, my guard, where am I in this world? He said, you know, you're thinking this time you lost the train. She even passed by you. They moved to the location. Everything changed. A different generation. Every 70 years, 70, 80 years, like it says in Tehilim and Tzadik, they moved already. But the, nisham, but the princess left you something that she would always use to comfort her. It's her scarf. He takes her scarf, he cries on it, and he cries on it. He has, I, I don't know if I have another chance to do it. Do I have another chance? Can I do teshuva? Can I save you again? Can I bring the princess back to the king? And while he's praying and looking, he shines it into the light. And when he shines it into the light, what does he see? He sees that even though the nishama is far, and it's in a place where we don't know. And how he's going to find his path back to Hashem is unknown. Still, he sees that there's a chance that it's possible. He grabs his guard. He said, we're going out on this quest to find uh, the princess. And he goes and he searches and he searches and he searches and he searches. Until he meets what? Until he meets in one of the deserts. Big tree, but under it, who's laying down? Big giant. You know, Abu when we, when, we, when we want to say about someone statue, what do we call him? Uh, he's a very big doctor. Or he's a very big dentist. Why? He's smart. He's successful. He knows what he's talking about. Nachon? He arrives at big man at uh, ironically under a tree, which we just said, it's, it's, like, it's a dad. It's a tree of knowledge. He tells him, please help me find this place where I can find the princess, the Nishama. All the smart people of the world, they say, the place you're looking for, Gan Eden, City of gold and diamonds? That doesn't exist. You can't find a city that's going to be full of gold and diamonds and one's going to steal, steal from it. And I'll prove to you that it doesn't exist. And he calls all the chayot. He calls all the animals. And animal by animal. Mamash. Behemot. They stand in line to each one to give their opinion that we don't care about. Why they think that the world doesn't exist. And the man sitting there. He's being miyuash. After miyuash. After miyuash. They're disappointed. After disappointment, he's being let down after being let down. And they're trying to pull it down. They're trying to pull his morale, da morale down. They're trying to make him give up. But throughout all that agony, throughout all those people, all those animals laughing at him and trying to pull him down, he stands on the fact where even though no one believes him, but he's standing alone and he's going to continue in this path. And he says, I'm not leaving. So now Yetzirah says, okay, he's about to walk away from me. Let me send you to my brother. My brother will help you. A new entity, a new giant, same shtuyot. They arrive to the giant. The giant looks at him, calls all the birds. The same thing, ah, repeats itself. The man gets all those suffering, all those letdowns. They're trying to make him sound unintelligent. They're trying to make him sound uh, uh, wrong. But still he holds on to it. Even though he holds on to it and he stands on his path, what happens right afterwards? It's how I feel he's going to lose him again because he's not leaving his path. I have another brother. 
He is more spiritual now. He, he, we, uh, the previous one did animals. I do birds. He does spirits. One level up. He goes to him and the exact same thing over again. Where he's being let down after let down, let down after let down. And after all those, those, those agonies and after feeling like nothing, he walks away crying, but he says, I'm still going to find the princess. And suddenly, what did he see? Shh, running by. A spirit that didn't testify to him. What is that spirit? He said, it's Nishmat HaTzadik. We say that the Tzadikim, they come down to the world, B'chinat Atzilut. The Tzadikim, they come down in the level of Atzilut, meaning they already repaired all what they had to repair. Atzilut is the seventh. Seventh is Shabbat. What is Shabbat? Shabbat doesn't take, it only gives. Shabbat doesn't take anything from you. It only gives you, it gives you an action Shama, it gives you Shefa, Kim, Mekor, Becha, etc. Nishmat HaTzadik comes down to give to others. He grabbed Nishmat HaTzadik, he says, why weren't you here? He said, no, 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 no. I was busy taking the nishama, uh, taking care of the princess, uplifting the daughter of the king, uplifting the nishama to much greater levels. Where is she? Ah, she's in Gan Eden. Finally, the man lifts his morale, goes to the gates, and he's about to enter the gates. Here's where we left off. So, but I want to know the ending of the story. I want the ending of the story. So this is the ending. There is no ending. You want to know why? Because the ending of the story didn't happen yet. Because the ending of the story is in our hands to finish it, to write it, to complete it, and to share with our next generations how we finished the story. How we saved our nishama. How we took our nishama from being captive yet Sarah and bringing it into light, into bringing it back to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to the king. And that's what I want everyone to go home thinking about. How are we going to end this story? How are we going to write the last chapter where we saved the princess, the daughter of the king? And with that, may Kadush Bahubat Hashem give everyone big